moment of reflection and education I shared in our weekly email of that sense of uh, may your home be a home for sages and wise people to share their words so you can literally bring drink in their words and I think that's what we'll be doing tonight but as I welcome you all I um we are going to open the evening first with our Kabbalat Torah a few members of our Kabbalat Torah group not the whole group to share the importance and the significance of Yom HaShoah and I will light our Yahrzeit candles um, <clears throat> after they speak I should just say that this is the group that have missed out thus far on going to Amsterdam and really understanding about European Jewry during and post Holocaust and we hope they will yet be there but um, for now we're really proud of them um, to be able to share um, some thoughts and words about Yom HaShoah. So we're just going to spotlight uh, the three of you with John and we are <clears throat> Yom HaShoah just if we needed to be reminded, Yom HaShoah is one of the modern sacred days that have been added to the Jewish calendar since, since the Second World War and since the creation of the State of Israel. And the first, of course, is Yom HaShoah. And anyone who has been in Israel on this date of the month of Iyar will know it's an extraordinary day where bus drivers and cars stop in the middle of the street and to get out of their vehicles to be able to mark and stand for the moment of silence. And so we as a congregation in the diaspora uh, intricately affected and involved and with the capacity as we do have to have members and friends of our synagogue who can add to bearing witness and sharing stories. And we're gonna hear from Joan in a moment. But first I pass over to you children uh, you're not children, you're young people, teens, and to your teacher, John, as I just help Joan just get on to the link. So I've got disconnected from the one. Joan, are you on mute? Yeah, it's all right. Uh, oh, are you ready? You, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, I just can yeah? mute for a second, so. Uh, Shalom, Lucy, you unmute, and Ben, you unmute. Okay. Shalom, everyone, and welcome to our show day presentation. Today, we're here to remember the millions of Jewish lives lost during the Holocaust and to honor the survivors and their families. The Holocaust was one of the darkest and most tragic periods in human history. Between 1933 and 1945, the Nazi regime, led by Adolf Hitler, systematically murdered six million Jews. The Nazi regime believed in the idea of racial purity and they saw Jews as a threat of their vision to a perfect society. Jews were forced to wear yellow stars, their businesses and homes were confiscated and they were sent to concentration camps. The concentration camps were brutal and inhuman. The majority of Jews were simply mass executed and their bodies disposed of in mass, mass graves or cremated in the camp's crematoriums. For those that were not killed upon arrival, they were forced to work long hours, often in dangerous conditions. They were given little food or water and were subjected to torture, medical experiments, and even forced to organize the dead bodies, clothing, and valuables of those who had been killed. Despite the terrible conditions, many Jews showed incredible strength and resilience. They formed underground resistance movements and risked their lives to help others. One example of this was in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. In 1943, Jewish fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto rose up against the Nazi regime, even though they knew that they were vastly outnumbered and outgunned. While the uprising ultimately failed, it remains an inspiration to this day. Today, we honour the memory of those who lost their lives during the Holocaust and we celebrate the resilience and bravery of those who survived. One way we can do this is by lighting a yacht site candle, which is a special candle that is lit on the anniversary of someone's death. We can also make a donation to a Holocaust remembrance organisation or participate in community events that honour survivors and their families. 
Another way to honour the memory of those we lost is by continuing to educate ourselves and others about the Holocaust. We can read books, watch documentaries and attend lectures to learn more about this important period in history. We can also work to ensure that our communities are inclusive and welcoming to all, regardless of their background. This is one of the most important lessons we can learn from the Holocaust. So proud of you. And I am, as you've asked me to, and Lucy mentioned it, going to light six yard site candles that um, on Holocaust Memorial Day, the day that uh, signifies or remembers the liberation of Auschwitz, uh, we light many more because we are remembering other genocides. Tonight in this date, in our calendar, we light these six uh, candles and uh, to remember, as, as the three of you have reminded us. So I thank you for sharing that and for allowing us. May those who lost their lives, both during and immediately after the experiences of Hitler, may they be remembered and honoured for a blessing. And you have paid tribute to them, the three of you, by introducing this evening for us. So I'm going to invite you to mute yourselves now, which I think you are. And I have the immense privilege to welcome Joan Salter, MBE, who uh, received an MBE from the then Prince Charles. So she has an immediate link to coronation from the then Prince Charles who gave her uh, her MBE for services to Holocaust education. Joan is known far and wide and is immensely busy, her schedule, uh, doing Holocaust uh, education from schools to university to synagogues and far beyond. And we are delighted um, that Joan, a relatively new member of our synagogue, that we get to hear Joan's story, which of course, because of the nature of our Zoom, she has truncated a little, but uh, to enable everyone to be able to ask questions. So Joan is going to share her PowerPoint just want to uh, check that you're all right to just press share screen now. Well, I've got this on full screen, that's the problem. <clears throat> I'm just going to help. Uh, yeah, I haven't me? said more about Joan because her story will be told right. by her. Hold so on. Oh, that's all plus A to my mute. Oh, oh. So we're just making sure that the screen, if you can take me back to Zoom on your computer, to the call, well then done. we need to screen share. That's right. If you go in there, and then, no, don't unmute and just press screen share. But then I can't see mine. Then if you go into there, right. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Now, no, you need to do screen share. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Are no. we in? Is it clear? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. If I get the thing on the full screen, I hope I don't muck it all up. You're fine. You're fine now. Yeah. You, you just see. carry on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so unmute. No, no, because we're okay. using my sound. Okay. Right. Now, um, sorry. Uh, this these. The story I'm going to tell you today is my own personal experiences during the Holocaust. However, I think most of you will have heard of the kinder transport and the narrative that Britain brought in over 10,000 children. The story I'm going to tell you is completely different to this because, in fact, in the end, Britain refused to bring us in. So I start with a map, can you see a map? Now, my parents were both Polish Jews. When they were, uh, sorry, when they were born at the beginning of the 1900s, there actually was not a country, Poland. But in the 1920s, Poland was reunited as a country. However, it reunited peoples from three different uh, empires. And the cultures were very different, not just within the Jewish communities, but within 
the Christian communities. So there was a lot of upheaval and a lot of people emigrated from Poland in the 1920s. And the green line is my father's line. He came from Tarnow, which was very close to Krakow. And as a young man, initially he was sent to Belgium as an apprentice to a distant re relative in the diamond trade. But my father was not a very good conformist and he soon left. Long story short, he settled in Paris and he became a, a businessman uh, copying Paris fashions and going home to Poland where they manufactured them. So by the time the Nazis came into power, he was quite well off. My mother came from Warsaw. She also came in the late 1920s. It was for her first marriage. She was a widow with a young child when she met my father and they were married in 1938. Okay, now I have to truncate this, so, so I skip out a lot. Now, what happened was, is that, as you know, uh, Poland was occupied, and that was the beginning of a war. And as soon as they occupied Poland, they set up ghettos. And it's very important to know there were no ghettos in Poland before. Uh, particularly in my father's part of Poland, which was part of the Austro-Hungarian, the Jews had a lot of freedom and education, etc., which they didn't have in the uh, Russian part. Anyway, so my mother and father were married. However, they were getting letters from Poland and were aware of what was happening. My father anticipated that France would be occupied, and he thought that Belgium would stay neutral, which is what it was started as. And the three of them, with my half-sister, moved up to uh, Brussels. And then I was born. Now, I'm going to go a bit more into that, but I want you to see the lines, the green line goes down from Paris, down into the part of France, which is called Free France. And that is the part of France I call Vichy, which was unoccupied uh, it, until 1942. Right, now that's my birth certificate. And it says I was born in February, 1940. 10th of May, the German forces invaded those countries. You can see, I've got the timeline in the back, but I won't go into everything in details, but you can see what I'm talking about. But, uh, General Patin became the French head of state and the prime minister was Pierre Laval. And there was also uh, René Bousquet, who was the head of the Vichy police. Now, it is important to know that the, um, the Vichy government, although they were technically head of state of the French, they actually were not only a collaborative government, but they actually were proactive in because the head of the Gestapo in France had fewer than two and a half thousand men, and he depended on the French police to do the roundings up. So we we're in Brussels in 1940, and there was a big roundup. They were targeting the foreign Jews, uh, of which the majority were Polish Jews because of this huge immigration from uh, Poland in the 1920s. My father was captured, and initially he was put in a prison over the border in France. And my mother stayed in Brussels with my sister and myself. My father was deported sometime at the end of 1940 on a train. And contrary to the images you will see of the sealed boxcars, he was on an ordinary passenger train. He jumped from it and he made his way back to Paris and he went into hiding in a cousin's apartment in the 11th arrondissement. That is very important. My mother was given permission by the authorities to travel back to Paris. 
After her first husband had died, she had remained in Paris and lived with some of her sisters. My mother was the second youngest of eight adult siblings. And these, the four girls, women, all married and were living in Paris. The four boys, men, remained in Poland. My mother's family were from Warsaw. Okay, now, these are pictures of my three aunts in, in Paris who we stayed with. And the most interesting thing about these photos is where the arrow is, that is my cousin. And she has actually got a yellow star on her lapel. Now, the yellow star in France was not imposed until the beginning of June 1942. So up until then, although we uh, weren't living a normal life, were very restricted, uh, the, the aunts were all married to French Jews, and the Pol it was the French Jews were not being targeted at that stage. So we did have a life to lead. So if you have stereotypical images of Polish Jews, I hope this gives you a completely different idea. Right, now, uh, these are just things that were happening uh, that over those two years and uh, what was going on in France. And slowly the different uh, restrictions were being imposed. And uh, then now the 27th of September, this the first ordinance was actually imposed by the Vichy government. And they said who was Jewish and the Jewish businesses were to be identified as such. And uh, there was actually rivalry between the French and the Germans when they started taking properties as to who the properties should go to. So it, it, the Vichy government were absolutely proactive in the rounding up of the Jews. Okay, now I'm going the, by the end of October, there was a, a formal collaboration between the French and the German, and that was between Hitler and Pétain. Okay, now what is important is that Come 1941, they began doing the roundups in the working class di districts of, of Poland. And the 11th district was where my father was in hiding and he was nearly rounded up. But actually the porter actually covered up and told it was the Vichy police when they came into the building to arrest the Jews in the building, it was mainly Polish Jews living there. And the porter pretended that there was nobody in the flat. And so my father was able to escape. And through contacts with the resistance, he was uh, bundled down into what was still the unoccupied part. However, by then, the Vichy government had set up camps in the northern part. There were already a lot of camps uh, left in the southern part left over from the Spanish uh, Civil War. And these were used later on. But at that stage, it was the camps in the northern part. And Drancy was one of the worst ones. OK, so my father has managed to get down this is a photo I took recently of Drancy Camp. If you read in the uh, books, they'll tell you it's in a suburb of Paris. Well, it, it's actually an hour drive outside Paris and it's an industrial town. And this was built as a social services flats and it's right on the main road. So people were able to see what was going on. Now, uh, the final solution in 1942, and the final solution was when the extermination of all Jews in Europe was laid down by the Wannsee Conference. Up until then, there had been people sent to the camps, but they technically were still labor camps. 
and uh, people died of starvation and overwork and the cold, but the extermination camps had not been set up. Okay, now what happened? It was becoming more and more um, hard line. Uh, Eichmann, who you might have heard of, was in Berlin overseeing the uh, Daniker, who was the head of the French. And uh, he, by then, because the gas chambers were working, they needed more and more people to send. And up until then, it was the men, age 18 to about 45, because they kept up this myth that they were only taking people for uh, labor. Anyway, so now I'm coming to 1942. My mother, July 1942, my mother went on a very hot day to register, uh, which she had to do every week. And you can see this quite heavy little girl here. That was me. <laughs> uh, and by this time, of course, I was about two and a half, although I think I'm a bit younger in here. And my mother was so proud of this photo because she, whenever I was naughty in the following year, she would say, I gave up, I didn't eat any food, I gave it to you to eat, you know, and things like that. So if you want a guilt complex, there it is. <laughs> so she's waiting in the queue and there's two policemen there in the office and the same two policemen and one policeman was really a very nasty anti-Semite and the people were all frightened of him but because it was a hot day and the nice policeman had a very short sorry the nice policeman had the long queue and the nasty one hardly anybody went in front so my mother went there and waited to give our names but my sister was jealous and said put her down pick me up and I started crying, my sister started yelling, and the uh, horrible policeman screamed at my mother, who was a very shy, tiny woman, and she waited outside until um, everyone had registered, and then she went in, and the other policeman actually warned her that we were to be rounded up. This was the first roundup that targeted women and children. Up until then, it was only the men. And again, it was the foreign uh, people. And my mother was still technically Polish. She hadn't been given French citizenship. And so she would have been amongst one of the ones. However, the policeman warned us. And again, through contacts in the resistance, we were smuggled out down into uh, the southern part which technically was still unoccupied. Although, as I said, there were the camps left over from the Spanish Civil War. And in 1940, uh, the Jews of the southwestern part of Germany, there's been very little written up about this, were actually deported to France. And they were put in those camps, even though technically it was unoccupied. And the intention at that stage was not to murder all the Jews, it was to get rid of them. And there was what was called the Madagascan plan, uh, that they were all going to be deported to this island of Africa. However, that didn't work out. And when I have spoken out about what is happening about the refugees, and I've been condemned because it's nothing like that. It was exactly like that. They were deporting them. They were getting rid of them out of Europe, but then they couldn't, so they started extermination. Now, the most important thing now is what happened on the weekend when we had already been smuggled out of Paris. It was the first roundup of foreign Jews uh, to, uh, sorry, the women and children. And Eichmann had actually not wanted the children to go because he knew there would be a backlash when people saw the children being rounded up. And even some of the French police refused to do it. And uh, so it was actually Laval, 
the head of he by this time he was the head of the Vichy government. It was he who suggested sending the children away. And what he said was it's for humanitarian because when the big roundup happened in Paris, uh, the mothers were separated from the children and the mothers were sent to a camp called Pithivius in the northern sector and the children were sent to Drancy. And what happened in Drancy was horrific because you would have little children, maybe 10 months old, who could barely walk, and an older sister or brother would be taking them to the toilet and things. And it was really horrific. Anyway, uh, over 4,000 children were picked up in that roundup and housed in that Dan Drancy housing estate. And altogether, 8,000 Jews, including elderly women and children, were housed in a velodrome. And if you saw the 2012 Olympics, you know a velodrome is a cycling uh, stadium. And the conditions there were horrible, but the voluntary organizations like the Red Cross were allowed in. And that's why we have so many witness accounts of what happened. However, as Eichmann had predicted, oh, one point is that Laval insisted that sending the children away was a humanitarian act. And I'm repeating these words because these are the words which our present Home Secretary has used about stopping the boats as a humanitarian act. So, you know, we really do have to understand how prejudice starts and how serious it can get. Now, what happened, there was actually a mass demonstration by non-Jews and the Catholic Church began taking children in and hiding them. And because of that, and some of the policemen were refusing to round the children up, it resulted, I think, uh, Danica had said they wanted 28,000 Jews to be deported on that um, trains, on those trains that weekend, and uh, only 18,000 went. And as I said, by that time, the uh, camps like uh, Auschwitz, but there were also three death camps, because part of Auschwitz still was a labor camp. But there were three death camps. There was one called Belschitz, which was not far from Krakow, where my family in Tarnow would have gone. And outside Warsaw, there was Treblinka. And then uh, there was another one called Sobibor. And those three were death camps. You got there on the train straight into the um, crematorium. So by this time, what was known as the final solution was well in hand. Now, when this happened and the backlash started, the Vichy government actually offered safe passage for the children and some of the elderly. And this is a memorandum I have found in the archives of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. I started my research in the 80s when nobody was really interested. And I think that is why none of the documents were redacted and I was able to find these. I don't even know if they're still in the archives. And there was a war cabinet meeting on the 18th of September, 1942. We were living in the South of France, but this was being discussed and the Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison uh, sent this memo to everybody in the war office. And he said that Emerson, who was the United, uh, sorry, the League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees had suggested that Britain take a thousand of these children. However, Mr. Otto Schief, who was the chairman of the committee that actually negotiated with the government to bring out 10,000 children, 
in two weeks after crystal milk, he actually changed that recommendation. And he said he recognized that it's not possible to admit large numbers of these unfortunate people. It would be necessary to draw a strict line of demarcation for the purpose of limiting the numbers. And he suggested that admission should be granted only to children who have close relatives. Well, the possibility of those uh, Polish Jews in France having a relative in the United Kingdom was virtually nil because the United Kingdom had virtually closed its doors at that stage to the Polish Jews. And he said exact figures cannot be obtained, but the total number should not exceed 300. Now, I could go in further details about the historic prejudice, even within the Anglo-Jewish community towards Polish Jews, but we haven't got time. But that was basically the problem. And it was the same problem in France. The established French community had an agreement with the Vichy that they would not be deported. So their attitude was, well, if the Poles, they, they don't belong here. They, if they're going, they're, they're the fault of uh, anti-Semitism. And as long as they go, everything will be all right. And that was a very strong attitude because during the 30s, the German Jews in Germany were given the opportunity to leave under restrictions, but very few of them actually believed what would happen because they looked upon Germany as their home. Okay, now the following thing, um, Morrison says to the cabinet, if this policy is approved, I propose to refuse all further concessions. And for instance, he was uh, asked to admit 28 children who were in a children's home in the Anarchy Park, and they had guaranteed entry to Palestine. And he said, if we allow any of these children in, it will be necessary to resist. In other words, if we let a few hundred in, after that, we won't let anyone else. And this was the recommendation which was approved by the War Cabinet, of which many MPs were Jewish. And during debates in Parliament over the next few months, no Jewish MPs spoke out. And I say this as someone who has sat and read every page of Hansard over the nine-month period and also read every document in the Foreign and Commonwealth Archives. It was a few Quaker MPs and the independent MP, Eleanor Rathbone, who fought to get children to safe havens, including to Palestine. Now, Palestine was part of the British mandate, and actually the Anglo-Jewish elite were not Zionists. They, it was all right for the Polish Jews to go there, but they did not want a Jewish state because they looked upon themselves as British and loyal to Britain. So these are some of the things we have to take on board, but because they're not popular, we don't hear very much about them, but it's something I feel very strongly about. Okay, now my father was rounded up again and he was held in a camp near Lake Annecy. He managed to escape and went across the Pyrenees into Spain. He sent the guide down for us, but we didn't turn up. And there was actually uh, an internment camp in Spain and the Quakers who were acting as the relief organization, they warned him that if he stayed, he would be in the camp. And they said, if you can get to Lisbon, you might be able to uh, joined the Polish Free Forces, which was part of the British Army. And he did manage to get to Lisbon. And by some miracle in the Polish embassy, now I told you he came from the part of Poland that had been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And he had gone to an ordinary school 
and he was friends with his Catholic neighbors. And by a miracle, the guy who interviewed him in the Polish embassy knew his brother, and he gave my father probably false papers. And he got to Britain in April 1943 on a troop ship. Now, what had happened, we, on the 11th of November, 1942, a few months after that big roundup, the whole of France was occupied by the Germans. And by this time, the Gestapo had enough numbers, they took over all the camps and they were the ones that were uh, putting people on the trains and sending them off. My mother did manage to escape over the Pyrenees. We were in the mountains for several nights. It was very cold. It was already the winter. And actually, I went to a memorial service a few years back in August. And the weather conditions in the mountains were still so terrible. So God knows what it was like in November when we crossed over. We were captured at the border, but we were captured by the Spanish and we were allowed into Spain. And my mother, the Quakers came to my mother. The Americans had finally, 15 months later, sent a ship. They actually chartered a Portuguese ship, which was neutral, to take the children from France, the ones that had originally been offered to go. And in the British Foreign Office files, they were saying, oh, you know, we can't bring them over on across the uh, channel or whatnot. So they just prevaricated. And as far as I'm aware, none of those children came to the United Kingdom. Anyway, so my mother gave us up to go to the United States. And this picture is of the house in Lisbon where we would uh, help while they were negotiating for us to go. And that is the Red Cross flag. Now, the reason they were negotiating is that America had quotas. In other words, they would say, oh, well, this year we can allow in 50 people from France. And that year we can allow a thousand people from wherever. And so the visas were actually for French children. And some of the children were French, but some of them weren't. And this is, um, sorry, this is a, oh, I've lost my, yeah, sorry, I jumped. This is a, a cable I found from the uh, chat from the um, joint, which was the American equivalent of the Central British Fund. And he was saying um, that the, American uh, ambassador in Barcelona was refusing to allow us to go because we didn't have French documents. I mean, it's just like what they're saying now about people crossing in the boats. They don't have papers. Well, of course you don't have papers. When you're running, you don't stand there saying, oh, well, I'm a Polish Jew. Anyway, finally we were allowed to go. And this is the little group of children. We went in drips and drabs. There was something like a hundred children who had managed to cross into Spain. Some of them, particularly the older ones, were orphans who had crossed on their own, but some were brought by a relative. And this is me. By this time, I would have been about three and a half. And that is my sister. And to be quite honest, we never had a close relationship because from her point of view, she'd had a very happy five, six years living with her mother and her aunts. And then her mother had married and she had to leave her friends and her school. And my parents, like so many parents at the time, shielded their children from the reality. And my sister never really understood why. All she felt is you know, this is her wicked stepfather. And then they presented her with a little sister. And I have to say, she never got over that, even as adults. Okay, so we sailed to America. And this is the manifest of the ship. And even then, with everything, to get into America, you had to 
fulfill certain qualifications. And they asked, could you read? Well, I was too young. What is your nationality? And we were all considered to be Polish, except there were obviously a few Belgian children there as well. But we were Polish. And right up the top here, it does say race. And then it says Hebrew. So we were all Hebrews. So even America had racial policy. I mean, it's easy to throw stones at Germany and Poland and say, oh, you know, they were anti-Semitic. But so was America, quite honestly. Anyway, this is a picture I found in a brochure where they were trying to raise funds for the children. And I was in an orphanage, and my sister actually was in hospital. They knew her father had died of tuberculosis, and she was ill on the ship. So for over a year, we were separated, and a couple came and more or less said, oh, well, that's a cute one. We'll have that one. And I went home with them. And by this time, I was nearly four, but my past was completely forgotten. My name was changed to Joan Farrell. They were a very, what you would call, upper middle class uh, family. And uh, so I lived with them for three years. I forgot my past. This is me in the garden. And we used to go to, he was uh, a dean of the medical school and he was a, a doctor. And every summer we used to go up to Maine because in those days, you didn't have mobile phones. And we used to go to a very isolated camp so that uh, he didn't get bothered by the telephone. Mm -hmm. So, and we lived in sort of very upmarket uh, shack sort of thing. And it, it, for him, it just gave him peace from the telephone. Then I came home one day in 1947 and uh, I was told that I didn't belong to this family. My past was completely gone. My language was gone. And I just didn't believe what my father was telling me. I'm talking about my American family. Now, in the meantime, by 1944, you can see on the thing how things were happening. And on the sixth, remember Morrison said there were children who had permits to go to Palestine, but Britain would refuse to bring them. So you can see on the 6th of April, the Germans deported children sheltering in an OZ shelter. And there was also uh, another one, which was uh, from the French. The French Jews had charitable homes, but they gave the children up without any problems. However, on the 13th, 1st of July, the last convoy left France, and the head of the French Jewish community, who had done all sorts of negotiations to save his family and gave up the children, he actually, he and his sons were actually on that train. So the reality is collaboration in the end didn't save any of them. And on that train, there were 300 children, including a baby born in the camp. So this, this is um, a plaque. There are plaques like this all over Paris, if you see them. And basically, if you see at the bottom, it says December 2001, because it was not until 1996 that the President Chirac of France finally acknowledged that it was the Vichy police who had rounded up the children. And that is what that plaque was saying. It was saying that uh, the children were rounded up by the, I seem to have lost that, but never mind. They were rounded up by the Vichy police who collaborated and these plaques, if you go to Paris, you'll see them and you'll see all the dates. It was not until the year 2000, which is, I don't know, over 60 years after the war, 
Up until then, France was looked upon as the victim of the Nazis, but the reality is not the French people, but the French Vichy government were actually proactive in the deportation of the children. So that is the end of the occupation happened in 1944 and Klaus Feld record and he found the cards of all the people deported and he and his research students, they counted every single one and 70, over 75 thousand people were deported from France, of which the majority were Polish Jews, and only two and a half thousand returned. 11,400 unaccompanied children were deported from France to the camps in the East, and it's estimated that fewer than 250 were alive at the end. So when you hear that Britain accepted the children, they accepted the children from Germany and Austria, and then another lot were allowed in from Czechoslovakia, but the Polish Jews, uh, they refused. So I find this very important because the narrative, uh, I mean, even the Home Secretary, the present one will tell you, how Britain has always accepted, it's always been a place of refuge, and it's not. So I've truncated. So from my very comfortable middle class home, I came to England. This is a photo of my mother. I think I showed you a photo at the beginning mm -hmm. of what she looked like. Very, very mm -hmm. glamorous. This is 10 years later. My mother, every single, my both sets of my grandparents, every one of my aunts, uncles, and cousins, except one sister of my mother, of my father, all the rest of that generation. And my mother and my father, my half-sister and myself, are the only ones of over 50 relatives of that generation who survived the Holocaust. So I've been very good. You really have. <laughs> wow, Joan. And I have truncated it. <clears throat> you really so, have. But to me, it really important because it, you know, this narrative of Britain having accepted all the uh, children is not true. And Eleanor Rathbone, who was an independent, she fought to get the children taken to Palestine and the British government refused because they had agreement with the Grand Mufti that they would not bring yeah. our Jews in. And sadly, the Anglo-Jewish community did, did Britain didn't disagree with yeah, that. Yeah, it's very interesting that you bring that. And I, I know that Leslie Urbach has talked to us a great deal uh -huh. about Eleanor Rathbone. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I want us to pause just because I can't imagine that there aren't questions. And we, if you can just stop screen sharing, uh, Joan, can you just press or, or right, I then. can come round to you? Um, right, okay, hold on, let me try and find. Uh, oh, I'm stop sharing. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. And then, um, yeah, so maybe we can see everyone. Um, Joan, thank you. I'm really aware that whilst you've dedicated your life to telling this story, it must take it out of you every time you tell the story. And I found that image of your mother and how you talk about the difference of her before and after the war, very poignant indeed. Um, we have a few moments for questions. We are very tight tonight because Rene and I are running an LJ session for the next six weeks on Perke Avot at eight, but we've got time for a couple of questions. And of course we will choose to say Kaddish at the end of the evening with the Yartzeit candles behind me. So um, jump in. Don't unmute. <laughs> okay, Joan and I are sharing sound. We're in the kitchen together. Anyone, any, yeah, anyone like to uh, jump in?
I can't see everyone. Let me just see if I can see. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, I can't see if anyone has. I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question. Please, thank you. I thought I'd just jump in. First of all, Joan, thank you. Hi. Hi, Hi Joan. We're old friends, so it's lovely to see you. And th thank you so much for sharing your story. I've heard bits of it before, but never altogether. And I think it's quite incredible. And you're, um, yeah, I'm sure you come across as so sort of calm and you obviously spent a lot of your lot of your time researching. And I think that the lessons that you know we can learn from when we listen to our current government and the things that people say and what they really mean and what they think about. I think you know you've brought many of those things through to us. So I suppose what I wanted to ask is um you're a member of our synagogue now and I know you've been a member of other synagogues before. It, it would just be interesting just to learn a little bit about your sort of Judaism and how that sort of feels given you know the horrific start to life that you had and obviously your parents had and then the wrench you know to go to America become an all-American kid by the look of things um even going up to Maine and then being ripped to that and then and then coming back and being with your family how, how did Judaism fit into all of that as you were growing as you became a grown-up and a teenager and beyond I'm just curious well my American family actually were very strict reform Jews and okay as a young child, I was taught we were Americans of Jewish religion. And then suddenly I'm put on a plane, come to England to completely broken people. And I, I get the impression that they were very integrated even before the war. However, their God had deserted them and they weren't having anything to do with their God. But ironically, because they were so terrified of the outside world, they sent me to an ultra-Orthodox Jewish school, which was the worst bit, uh, you know. I mean, in America, you know, you, you discuss things with your teachers. And one of my first memories at this ultra-Orthodox school, all the teachers were foreign. They could barely speak English. I had a spelling test, and I got the test back. And five out of 10 were wrong. And I knew, you know, we know English and American spelling is different. But when you're seven years old, you don't. And I knew that the teachers were wrong. And I thought, well, you know, they're foreigners. They don't understand. And I went up the teacher to explain to him that he was wrong. And I got this cane on my head. Oh, just hang on, Joan. We've just lost Rebecca, so we've lost your sound. Joan, we can't. Joan, I don't. We can't. Can anyone else hear Joan? Uh, no, she's a silent at the moment. No. So, Joan, 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 can you stop a minute? Can you unmute because Rebecca's computer is gone. Did you mute? Yeah, thanks, Joan. We, can't, we couldn't oh, right. hear you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, it's not your so fault. Anyway, I went to Israel with all mm -hmm. my own prejudices by that stage uh, because the youth movement I was involved with was not Zionist. And um, it was that year in Israel. We were young. I was young. Israel was young. And I learned a lot of things. I still, actually, we had to do practical work and I wasn't part of a, a, a Zionist youth movement, but I used to go to different kibbutzim at the weekends and whatnot. And I remember I was on an Orthodox kibbutz for, I forget what which holiday it is, when you look up and God looks down on you. And they had a yeshiva on the kibbutz, but in the daytime, mm -hmm. what? Uh, yeah, it was Shavuot. Yes, my mm -hmm. rabbi, thank goodness. In the daytime, we were all dressed like normal people in hot weather shorts, but for the holiday, the men went into the yeshiva and we were allowed on the roof to look down. And it was looking down on middle age Poland. They had all taken on... And I thought I'm watching theater. And I think that 
was when sort of the uh, superstitious side of religion left me. Uh, I married my husband, came from what I call auction shoot orthodoxy, and he actually was not particularly interested in being Jewish. And um, so for a long time, we our children didn't go to religion school or anything, which of course now my yeah. eldest blames me, but you know, being a mother, that's, you know, whatever mm -hmm. you do is wrong. And uh, when my foster parents died, and I went over there, and I thought I have to come on really and absorb the past. And I came back and I sat down with my father and took notes. And I then joined the liberal synagogue. My husband had never stepped inside anything besides an orthodox. And even then they had dragged him in. So for about 10 years, I joined on my own and he started coming to lectures and stuff. So one year as a birthday present, I gave him membership. And yes, I am Jewish. I'm, the Holocaust is very much part of me, but it doesn't define me. I have a life beyond the Holocaust. Thank you, Louise. No, thank you. Josie just mm -hmm. asked in the chat, which liberal synagogue did you did you join? Chosen tonight to crash. Oh, good. Um, man. No. Oh, I'm um, yeah. okay. okay. Maybe, maybe we have, uh, I see Janet. I think we've got time just for one more. So Janet, and then I'm going to ask her to, to say Kaddish together. Hi, Joan. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Um, and also, thank you so much for standing up to Suella Braverman. You you did us all proud. Um, uh, we've never met before. I'm a friend of Shelley's. I wanted to ask you, did you ever see the American parents again? Can you Can you repeat that question, Janet? Yes. Uh, hello, Joan. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for standing up to Suella Braverman as well. You did us all proud. It was a pleasure. It yes. was a pleasure. It was definitely a pleasure. Um, I'm a friend of Shelley's. Um, she oh, was right. a deputy with me. Um, did you ever see your American family again? Yes. I Actually, the first 10 years after I came, I went backwards and forwards. So that was quite traumatic adapting to different cultures. And then eventually my relationship with my foster mother broke down and I settled in England, but I've always kept in touch. I actually, in their final years, both sets of parents were very ill and I actually was crossing the Atlantic. And it's like I put on a different coat, which side of the Atlantic I was on. I'm still very close my foster sister we always got on and so yes i've kept in touch very sadly my birth sister died about four or five years ago yeah thank you you're muted rabbi rebecca Muted yourself. Mute. No. Yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh. Yeah. It's your. We can hear you, Joan. I don't know where my mic is. Okay. Okay. Um, we are going to finish this evening with huge gratitude to you, Joan, for sharing the story and for talking about your Judaism and. We are, uh, you have been a member of our synagogue and we're grateful that you found us, you joined us and that you are with us and have shared your story. And I'm really grateful to our KT young people for, for their creativity in introducing the evening. And we're grateful to you. Um, I think you really brought something juxtaposed with Joan's story. So Josie, if you're okay to screen share Kaddish uh, for Joan and I, we have the Yatsai candles behind us, but I am going to um, invite you, keep, keep yourself muted, but say the Kaddish out loud if you would like, and Joan and I will say it here, but just an opportunity to 
pay tribute. I, I think, Joan, your focus on the children and the babies and from Val d'Hiver onwards and, yeah, those plaques in Paris that you see now, uh, you brought a huge poignancy. So, Josie, thank you so much for sharing Kaddish. And let us offer this as our offering tonight. Yet Gadal, Yet Gadal, Shame Rabba, Biama, Rahim Te, Yam Lich Mahute, Bahai Yahan, Biomehon, Bahai, the whole Beit Israel, Bagala, this man Karif, Amen. Yehesh, Mera, Borah, Leolam, or Mea, Maya. Yilpadar <laughs> Bimru, Amen. O se shalom bimroma, who ya se shalom, Aleno via call Yisrael, via call bene and dumb, Bimru, Amen. Then thank you to all of you as really vital, important ADEM witnesses bearing tribute to this story. So I, I shared in the chat. Uh, that there is another uh, session um, continuing now at eight o'clock on the study of Perkei Avot, which is traditional to study uh, between Passover and Shavuot. So uh, there was a Zoom link in the chat uh, that hopefully you found, but if you need it and don't have it, then you can just email me right now um, as we go over there. But thank you. Thank you for coming. And next Tuesday night, we join with liberal Judaism and synagogues all across uh, liberal Judaism to respond to the 75th anniversary, to share letters that have been written to Israel. And um, it's not too late if you want to write a letter of 300 words or less, uh, your letter to Israel in this moment now. So we'd love to have more of them. So wishing you well, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Joan, thank you so much thank for you. sharing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you to everyone. everyone. And thank you, Louise.